What's up guys, it's Doll Matter here, and today we are going to be reacting to a new channel. So this one is called Paper Skies, and I've never seen anything from them before. Uh, and the video is called The Backstory of Russian Missiles Hitting Toilets in Ukraine. Now, when I when I got recommended the, the video, um, I thought this would be about you know something of the current Ukraine conflict, but judging by the description of the video, it has much more to do with the Soviet Union. So I assume... This is some kind of missile testing that was going on during the Soviet Union, but I'm not entirely sure. I'm guessing uh, that'll be explained rather quickly. But anyway, link to the original video down below. And again, this is the backstory of Russian missiles hitting toilets in the Ukraine by Paper Skies. Let's jump into it. It's now been a year since the beginning of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. A long year full of pain, suffering and loss for millions of Ukrainians. And also a year of regular bravura reports by the Russian Air Force on the destruction of various Ukrainian military targets, which in reality were oh, wait, so is this based on the Ukraine conflict? and civilian infrastructure. I could talk all day about the Russians, whether military or so-called ordinary people who find vigorous delight in regards to the death of Ukrainian civilians, but this is aviation history and not the world of animals channel. Therefore, I want to draw your attention to something else. If you have been following the news of this war, you may have noticed that among all the houses, hospitals and schools destroyed by the Russian missiles in Ukraine, there were also a number of hits on ordinary outdoor toilets. Of course, you may think that those hits were nothing more than just a weird coincidence. It is also fair to think that those news stories could have been just simple fakes created so to mock the Russians. Okay, well, Indeed, so this is it's actually hard to recently imagine that the Russian precision guided Hot 29 missile worth over a quarter million dollars would somehow lock onto someone's outdoor cottage toilet, which is basically nothing more than a lone standing plastic or wooden box with a small path leading to it. That's an outhouse. But if I tell you the story of how the Russians back in the 70s used a yellow sand road to cheat on the Hot 29 missile trials, then probably... Oh. Hot oh, okay, so that's what the Soviet Union part was about. It was about the testing they were doing during the Soviet Union. So this actually did happen recently. That is kind of embarrassing. I mean, honestly, with how Russia's... Yeah, with how the, the war's been going for them, although they did just capture a key city, but, um, you know, it's we're like, what, a year and a half into this conflict and they still haven't taken over the Ukraine, and pretty much everyone thought it was going to be just wiped off the map immediately. I mean, Russia's been dropping the ball pretty hard. 29 toilet heats in Ukraine will no longer look that extraordinary. <laughs> my nose is stuffy. Sorry if you hear me breathing. I'm like, got a mouth breathe. My nose when is speaking stuffed. about Russian weapon technologies, the modern examples of which are usually just upgraded versions of Soviet-era developments, it is almost impossible to avoid the matter of the Russians copying Western technologies. The Russians usually prefer to either simply ignore these accusations or say that there is nothing wrong with copying. Everybody does it. Even the Americans themselves sometimes copied the Russians, which, to be fair, is somewhat true. Yeah. Although the main difference... I mean, and to be, and to be fair, to, to the... like. A lot of, especially for like the first 15 to 20 years after the war, a lot of it was just copied German technology. Now, a lot of it was, you know, German prototypes, right? A lot, it was never really stuff that was actually mass developed, uh, with the exception of a lot of the rocket technology. Um, but yeah, I mean, countries are always spying on each other and stealing each other's technology. Now, you know, a counter argument to that counter argument is that. Communist countries tend to do it a lot more than other countries just because they don't have the, you know, the competing defense industry corporations uh, trying to outdo each other in order to do it, right? It's usually some state-run program. You see this with China right now, too, right? Everyone's worried about China and how they're catching up to the Americans and all of this, but most of the catching up to the Americans they're doing is not, like, internal development. A lot of it is just them stealing American technology, so, yeah, how worried should you be? Yeah is that the Russian military which copies Americans exists in real life, while the American military which copies the Russians is mainly in Hollywood movies. In 1998, the HBO network released a comedy film called The Pentagon Wars. The opening scene of the movie pictures a hearing before the House Armed Service Committee, where General Partridge, played by Kelsey Grammer, is accused of using various tricks and gimmicks so faulty weapons could pass military trials. One such trick was the general ordering electric hot plates to be taped to the surface of an armored vehicle <laughs> so to help the heat-seeking missile find its target. It is indeed a hilarious episode that could hardly be imagined happening in real life, but 
but there is always Russia. <laughs> the, that the funny episode created for this American comedy greatly reminds one of a real-life episode of the Soviet military cheating while demonstrating to its high command the new H-29 missile, which refused to lock onto its target. This episode was described by the famous Soviet test pilot Vladimir Kandaurov in his book. But before we dive into this hilarious story, I want you to learn one word in Russian. Okay, so yeah, that's... Uh, the Pentagon Wars, obviously we watched a bunch of videos that have been debunking the Pentagon Wars, I think most notably Laser Pig. Um, which I think actually was on a laser pig video that I was recommended this video. But, uh, yeah, a lot of the stuff that happens in Pentagon Wars is it's kind of funny because you never, like, so, so much of the stuff that happened in the Pentagon Wars is either not true or it is, like, greatly exaggerated um, by people who had basically an axe to grind. A lot of it had, yeah, anyway, we, we've watched that video before, so... I bet most of you know some Russian words like Privet, Nazdarovye, Babushka, Balalaika, and judging from the average age of my audience, even such words as Perestroika. However, those are just simply words with only one straightforward meaning. Meanwhile, there is one word that I recommend you learn, which carries a far richer and a broader meaning and in a way may help you better understand Russia and even some historic events, whether of today or 100 years ago. This word is smekalka. If translated from Russian to English literally, the closest meaning would be the word savvy, except it wouldn't be 100% correct, and here is why. The English dictionary describes the word savvy as a practical understanding, shrewdness or intelligence, especially in practical matters, common sense, and it is exactly the latter definition which could not in any way be applicable to the Russian smekalka. Which is why, when translated to English and taken into consideration the Russian reality, arguably the closest to the proper meaning of smekalka would be freaking dumb. <laughs> when it comes to the so-called Russian military smekalka. Basically, smekalka means the ability of a person to find a smart solution in a difficult situation. To be fair, there is nothing wrong with that by itself. Which so is it basically means like MacGyvered, right? Like, I guess that's... I feel like the only words we really have for that would be like colloquial words, right? Like obviously MacGyvered would be one. Um, scuffed, depending on the context, might be another. Um, Jimmy rigged would be another, right? Like something where it like implies, yeah, it worked, but like it's not the ideal situation type thing. Is why words like savvy are present in many languages. However, what makes Mikalka different in comparison to similar words is that in Russia it is praised to the highest possible extent on a very cultural level. The thing is that finding a good solution makes ordinary Russian people think of themselves as very smart and even unique. And such a self-perception is extensively cultivated and supported. Shit, by we didn't have reverse soldiers in the anti-tank weapons. We had to do something Smikalka other than in real fight. They'll Russian be killed. People forget to question their leadership about how they ended up in that difficult situation in the first place. I know, for some of you, it doesn't make any sense. So let me give you a fresh example. <laughs> you, you learn to fight tanks with only your hands and smokalka. You're the smartest soldiers in the world. On this video, soldiers that are about to be sent to the war in Ukraine learn with surprise that the Russian army will provide them with only a uniform, while the rest of the military equipment they should take care of themselves. Жон, девушек, матерей просите, прокладки. Самые дешевые прокладки плюс самые дешевые тампоны. Тампоны знаете для чего? Нет, Пулевое ранение прям туда вводите и все. Jesus Christ, this... Oh my God. Is this real? This feels like this has to... Like it's... If it was any other country but Russia, I would say this has to be a propaganda video, but like... Everything we've seen come out of Russia, the country is just a fucking basket case, man. Okay, 
Had this video appeared in a normal society, the very least reaction would be resentment about such a barbaric attitude towards your soldiers. Meanwhile, in Russia, the main thing they see in the video is a smart solution in a difficult situation. While in a normal society, such a video would certainly raise big questions about your leadership, for the Russians, the video only reaffirms the supremacy of the Russian mindset. I mean, how would you otherwise explain the fact that no other army in the world has come up with such an elegant solution of using tampons for wound treatment? For the Russians, the explanation is obvious. <laughs> it is military smikalka. And I mean, the funny thing is other nations have, but it's usually like reserved for combat athletes. Like, uh, I, I grew up doing combat sports. It's actually pretty common for gyms to have like tampons in case somebody gets a bloody nose. Um, you know, Kleenex works too, but tampons are just like, yeah, ready-made. I guess, ta yeah, it's tampon, right? Um, yeah, because pads are the, yeah. Okay, so yeah. But yeah, uh, other, other nations, I think the difference between like the, the Russians and the other nations is that's like a thing that like you'll see in like a, a privately owned gym as like an easy solution to a bloody nose, not like a m massive public organization that's, you know, state-sponsored using it instead of actual medicine. Russian history is full of such examples of military smikalka, which in essence are simply freaking dumb and tragic, because the outcomes of their seemingly smart solutions are at best useless, but most of the time are simply harmful to their own interests. But today I want to tell you the story of a rare Smikalka example, which was actually hilarious and quite amusing. It is the story of the H-29 missile and its 1979 trials. Elites, now that we've made travel. <laughs> what is this? Um, honestly, I'm surprised they had those missiles back in the 70s, because, like, it, it seems like a lot of the stuff the Russians have been releasing even today. I, I guess that's kind of the whole meme, right, about them still using so much Soviet technology and the few things they have that are modern don't actually work or they just don't have enough numbers of them to actually do anything. Um, because, yeah, it seems like in this war, everything they've had is Soviet technology. They've been get, being outgunned by old like 1980s and 90s american weapons that have been and, and french and german all this other stuff that's been sold to the ukrainians or donated to the ukrainians who killed the in radio the mid -70s, star 70s soviet ground attack aviation was facing a big problem the actual ground attack component was seriously complicated due to the lack of a capable precision guided weapon the thing is that the recently adopted soviet air to ground missiles like h23 and h66 appear to be relatively weak for the efficient destruction of an enemy's frontline targets such as command posts bunkers bridges depots etc this part of the problem however was relatively easy to fix and could be solved by simply increasing the explosives weight in the missile's warhead the hard part was guiding the missile to the target. The thing is that until then the precision guided air to ground missiles were primarily radio controlled. To put it simply, the pilot would first have to find and visually identify the target, launch the missile and then, while visually tracking the flight of the missile, would manually guide it towards the target using the radio control system. Oh my the god, that's scuffed. The drawback of such an approach, other than its poor accuracy, was that the pilot had to simultaneously guide the missile and control his aircraft while flying towards the... You have to control... You also have to have, like, fucking hawk eyes. Like... You're, what, thousands, hundreds, if not thousands of feet up in the air, trying to hit something on the ground while, like, looking out and flying your plane, right? Like, what kind of dumbass solution is that? The target. That, in turn, meant exposing the plane to anti-aircraft defenses, whose capabilities had developed significantly, and thus, there was a huge risk of the pilot being shot down while guiding the missile to the target. One of the possible solutions to this problem would be the so-called fire and forget missiles. After their launch, such missiles did not require further external intervention, so the pilot could turn away his aircraft back to safety and would not need to enter the danger zone. Unfortunately, radio guidance could not deliver that. What could was video. You know, the radio or the television star. guidance system, to be precise. The problem, though, was that back then this TV system didn't exist and was yet to be developed. 
that is, it hadn't yet been developed in the USSR, since the French and British, as well as the Americans, had already tested and even tried in action TV-guided bombs and missiles. Put simply, television-guided missiles use an optical contraseeker for their guidance. Such missiles have a video camera in the nose that transmits a grayscale image to the screen in the cockpit, so the pilot can locate, identify, and then lock the missile onto a high-contrast target. A huge advantage of TV guidance is the fact that after the launch, the the Soviets really screwed themselves by like you know with their economic system because it it didn't have an emphasis on like just consumer goods, and so much technology comes out of consumer goods, right? Like somebody will take some random consumer technology, apply it to the military, um, and then it becomes like this this really important thing, and, you know. And it's not like a one way street, right? Like it's it's obviously both ways. A lot of consumer technology started off as military technology, most famously probably GPS. But, you know, with, with, with the Russians, that is very much a one-way street, right? Like, military technologies might become consumer technologies, but there's no consumer technologies becoming military technologies because there's no competing consumer companies. Missile will guide itself towards the target, thus leaving the pilot free to maneuver the aircraft and, if needed, avoid or evade possible threats. Also, since the missile is guided to the contrast image saved in the missile's memory, the missile is resistant to various electronic jams. However, TV guidance's primary advantage is at the same time the very reason for its main flaw. Its accuracy is highly dependent on the visibility of the target, meaning such missile can't be used at nighttime or in harsh weather conditions or when anything else makes the target less visible. Even simple smoke from explosions on the battlefield or just the camouflage of the target can seriously confuse the missile seeker. Even changing the angle of it, right? Like lock or <clears> even <throat> accidentally lock onto another. When, like if you're in a tank. Oh yeah, that's another good point, right? The plane's locking onto another plane. Um, but when it comes to the tank, like if the tank changes direction, then like it would depend on how much variation there is in it. But then like how advanced is the AI at the time that was going to decide that, right? Like the algorithm or whatever? Another high contrast object in the vicinity of the intended target instead. Such a drawback is typical to pretty much any existing TV guided weapon, and the Soviet Hot 29 air to surface missile wasn't in any way an exception either. Yeah, it's it's honestly kind of fascinating that like T now they seem so archaic, right? I'm mean, I'm sure some country well obviously Russia still uses them because you know they're Russia, but it just seems so archaic nowadays. Like using a TV guided weapon. Uh, do, do any Western countries use that? I feel like everything in the West is just GPS now. I'm probably way wrong there. The Soviets' intense work in the 70s on developing improved air to ground weaponry resulted in the appearance of the new Hot 29 missile. In comparison to the previous Hot 23 missile, the Hot 29's warhead was three times heavier and was capable of causing serious destruction. For instance, when attacking concrete runways, the missile left a crater in the ground with a diameter of 15 meters and about 6 meters deep. A huge advantage of the new missile was its modular design. A simple change of the warhead could switch the missile to either television or laser guidance. However, laser guidance still required highlighting of the target, whether by the pilot himself or by someone on the ground in close proximity to the target. In contrast, the TV version of the missile was capable of utilizing the needed fire and forget principle. Uh, kind of. As Vladimir Kandaurov recalled when working on the MiG-27K, which was supposed to become the most advanced ground attack aircraft in the Soviet Air Force, he was also involved in trials of the new armament, in particular the trials of the Hot 29 air-to-surface missile. As he recalled, the new missile was great, it was big, it was powerful, and could accurately hit even the smallest target, like you could aim not at the building, but at a particular window of that building. That was possible, however, only if the missile could properly lock on the target, which the Hot 29 had some big issues with. To be fair, having and fixing issues with new weaponry is not at all unusual. All in all, this is exactly the reason test pilots and engineers exist. However, the initial troubles with the Hot 29 were a little bit too much even for such an experienced test pilot as Kandaura. What made things worse was that on top of the technological issues, there were also some other unique complications. As Kandaurov wrote in his book, one day he was called to his commander who ordered him to fly to one of the shooting ranges to take part, as he said, in the big show, which was supposed to be the demonstration of the new types of aircraft armament to the Soviet high command. 
and the Rogue Owners that replied that the HUD-29 was still in a raw condition and its level of readiness was such that just a simple smoke left on the firing range from the preceding performer could completely blind the missile seeker and thus ruin the show. This is why you go there and figure something out on the spot, replied his command. <laughs> oh, the Smokolka. We're back to the Smokolka. Yeah, go figure it the fuck out. Uh, okay. <laughs> Man, I'd be, uh, being in the Soviet Union, I'd be, like, so sketched about that because, like, you can't even, oh, uh, like, your superior officer, you can't even report them for anything, right? So you go there, and you could, you know, in theory, you could get, like, other people to have, like, a, a fake bomb set up in the right spot. That way, you know, it launches and then it blows up somewhere else, but, you know, where it's supposed to in case it doesn't hit there, but yeah, uh in the highest level of mastery of the drop responsibility on someone else's skill. After arriving at the firing range, Kandaurov reported to General Ilyev Supran, the deputy chief commander of the Soviet Air Force, who was responsible for the overall organization of this new weapons demonstration. The entire range is camouflaged in a natural green color, explained General. We want to test our new weapons, including the HUT-29 missile, in close to real conditions. Your task is to destroy the plane inside the hangar. Do you think you can hit the hangar's gate? asked the general. Kandaurov honestly replied that there was gonna be a big problem. He had already made a test flight over the range and found that the HUT-29 Seeker couldn't lock on literally anything in that spring green nest. What? This is utterly unacceptable. How dare you say this to the second highest commanding officer of the Soviet Air Force? Such a defective missile shouldn't be demonstrated at all then, would have said the general in any normal country except Russia. Any ideas what to do? asked General Supran instead. Paint the hangar's gate yellow, suggested Kandaurov. I don't know what you call the number which just by the tiniest fraction is bigger than zero, but this number would perfectly describe the probability of NATO painting all their military objects yellow <laughs> in the case of war with the Soviet Union. However, for the Russian military... I mean, honestly, it is a smart solution that, like, not a smart solution for actually getting an effective weapon, but that's a very smart solution for, you know, getting through the day. <laughs> because it seems like that's very much what the Soviets were doing, was just trying to get through to the next fucking day, man. Like, it, it almost seems like it's just a a country, you know, I, you know the, the worker's paradise. It's literally a country of workers who hate their jobs. <laughs> it's just trying to get to the next day. Smikalka, that was not of any importance at all. The next morning, General Supran approached Kandaurov on the airfield and told him in a conspirational tone not to worry because the previous night the matter had been taken care of, exactly as Kandaurov had asked, and even better. Kandaurov relied on the general's words, jumped in the cockpit of the MiG-27, took off and headed to the shooting range. At the scheduled time, he entered the zone and started his combat approach, anxiously looking for a yellow spot among the greenness on the firing range. As he recalled later, to his surprise it wasn't that easy, and he had already started getting nervous since he was almost out of time when he finally noticed some bright spot ahead of him and started preparations for the missile launch. And the missile seeker though stubbornly refused to lock on the yellow spot. After a few unsuccessful attempts, he managed to get a weak lock and just shot the missile in that direction, hoping for the best. He swiftly turned his aircraft to the right while watching on screen the flight of his missile. The missile was quickly approaching the target and soon he saw on the screen how the bright spot formed into the hangar's gates, which were quickly getting bigger and bigger in size, but then all of a sudden the missile's crossbar started to go down away from the gates and switched to a bright road in front of the hangar. Kandaura oh. just helplessly watched as his missile's lock went further no. down the road and hit the ground in front of the hangar, leaving both the hangar and the aircraft inside untouched. As he later recalled, he was stunned and confused, and while flying back to the airfield, he was vigorously trying to figure out where the heck that bright road had appeared from right in front of the hangar. He learned the answer right after landing. General Supran, who was waiting on the airfield, told him that they had been worried about Kandaura, and so at night they had made a yellow sand road leading to the hangar so to help him and his missile find the target. I'm Bro, oh, what? like all you would have had to do is make it a different color. I'm assuming because I'm I'm guessing that's how it bases it. Like, I'm guessing that's how it works, right? It, it recognizes the color. It has like a you know something to check the delta on the color, um, and then just goes right into it. 
Bro. Like, you could have literally used any other color, and that probably would have worked. Fortunately, to the Hot 29 missile, any other color the yellow sand for the appeared road. to be brighter and more distinct than its surroundings, thus making the missile lock on the sand road instead of the hangar. I don't know how General Sopran came up with the idea of a yellow sand road, but I can't help but thinking that in May 1979, at the exact same time, the famous Elton John was visiting the USSR with his show, which in particular included the well-known song Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. Anyway, this fail didn't stop the development and trials of the Hot 29, and eventually the missile was accepted into service in 1980. The Hot 29 was then widely used and exported to all the countries that were operating Soviet-made aircraft, and eventually became the most common and popular Soviet and then Russian-made missile in the world. The Hot 29 is still in service. Oh my God! So all these countries are still currently using this fucking thing. Okay, who do we got here? The most common and popular. All right, so former operators, obviously, you have all of the you know Eastern Bloc countries. Uh, Still operating at Poland, Ukraine, and Belarus. Belarus makes sense, but Poland and Ukraine is kind of interesting. Um, Bulgaria also. Uh, I, who's Bulgaria aligned with? Are they are they neutral or are they EU aligned? I'm actually not too sure on like Bulgaria's current political situation. Um, I'm surprised a lot of these countries. Maybe they just don't have the money for an air force. But a lot of like the former, you know, the the stands that were formerly part of the. Uh, the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union. That's kind of interesting. Um, these ones kind of make sense because a lot of them, I think, are now at war with Russia or have been. The Chinese still using it. Wow, the, the countries that are still using it is kind of fascinating. You would assume the Chinese would develop their own system by now. Soviet and then Russian-made missile in the world. The Hot 29 is still in service and in particular the Russians often use it against Ukraine. I don't have the exact answer to why this sophisticated and expensive Hot 29 missile, when attacking, as the Russians say, targets of strategic importance, also hits ordinary outdoor toilets. Maybe it's just a coincidence that happens again and again. Maybe it's just it's gotta be color similarity. Households in Russia don't have a normal indoor toilet, and thus the Russians consider all toilets as targets of strategic importance. Or maybe it's some weird technological glitch that makes the Hot 29 forget its target and go back to its roots and follow a yellow sand road. That sometimes happened to lead to an outdoor toilet. I imagine it's probably something to do with like whatever they're targeting is one color and the toilet's the same color. Or, or like I guess the outhouse. But oh my god bro. I can't believe so many countries still use those missiles. When I mentioned earlier that Russian history is full of such examples of military smikalka, I wasn't exaggerating by any means. Cases of military cheating similar to the Hot 29 had been happening in Russia not only in the branch of aviation, but also in the Navy and ground forces. They had been happening during peacetime as well as in the hardest days of World War II. They involved ordinary Russian people. Oh, World War II, I'm well aware of. Soviet leadership, such as World War II, man, when I was reading up on, uh, and we actually watched a video on this too. Some of the tank factories. Oh my god, I was surprised any of those tanks worked. The, the fucking shit you hear coming out of there? Jesus Christ. Kida Khrushchev, for instance. If you want to know more, watch my video about a few other cases of the Russian military cheating, now available on my streaming service Nebula. Nebula is a place where top educational creators like Mustard, Real Life Lord, Not Just Bikes and many others upload new videos every day and where you can enjoy watching videos without any ads or sponsor messages. Since recently, along with access to amazing educational content from your favorite creators, you also get free access to Nebula classes, where those creators teaching you how they create and how to be well, as successful creator, this is something I wish existed when I started my own YouTube journey. However, the best part of Nebula, if you ask me, is that it's a unique place where you can watch exclusive content, made possible because creators of Nebula don't need to worry about censorship that can demonetize your video for simply saying a few words that YouTube may consider as potentially shocking for the audience. This is exactly what happened to my video about a small airplane crash in Paris. Hon honestly, that's something that like, it just does not make sense to me. Right, if people want to watch it, and, and this is equally for the advertisers as well as YouTube, because a lot of it is advertisers don't want to be seen on certain content. If, if people want to watch it, who cares, right? You're getting your, uh, your uh, like, as long as it's, you know, your audience, right? Like, you, obviously, you're, you're not going to be, like, have advertisements for, um, 
kids toys on like a video about like 25 most fun things to do as a single mother right so like you you want you want to find the target audience right so you're, you're you know kids toys you're gonna want like the advertisements to be on like kids channels and channels for like parents and moms and dads and stuff like that right like the audience is actually gonna buy them or ask the parents to buy them um but like when it comes to like just restricting ads i just don't get it it doesn't make sense to me if people want to watch it let them watch it right I don't want this to happen again to any of my future videos, especially considering that I have big plans for the year 2023, in particular to make new videos more often as well as start a second channel. If you have ever considered supporting my work, then watching my videos on Nebula would be one of the best ways to do that. So join me on Nebula, click the link below and get a Nebula subscription with a special discount for fans of Paper Skies. Do that now and I will see you in the next video. Thank you so much for watching. Yes, so I, I really enjoyed that video. I thought it was pretty funny. You know, um, it, it's kind of hilarious how, like, stuff that, like, it, you know, in the West we make is, like, comedic jokes over, you know, drastically over-exaggerating our military's incompetence because they'll do, like, one thing and then, you know, we blow it out of proportion and we'll make all these movies about it. And then you're just like, oh, yeah, by the way, in Russia this actually happens, but, on, you know, all the time and on an arguably much worse scale. Uh Where's this guy from, by the way? He, like, he's, he's got an Eastern European accent of some sort. He sounds like he's probably Slavic. I'm, so is he, like, Polish, Ukrainian? Uh, I'm assuming he's not Russian, because he obviously seems to have uh, some disdain for the Russian people. Uh, you can tell, like, at, at the start of the video. But, um, you know, if he's Ukrainian, well, I mean, honestly, if he's anywhere from Eastern Europe, that kind of makes sense. <laughs> you know, Russia's not exactly the most liked country there. But uh, anyway, let me know what you think below. Like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.